Hey everybody, this is Off Leash with Eric Prince. I'm Mark Serrano. Drone technology is changing the nature of warfare. We've got the expert. So Eric, you were a pioneer of sorts with drone technology. You've got expert insights into it. Let's start with generally, how is drone technology changing the nature of warfare? It is certainly accelerating. You know, the, the, the first strategic offset the U.S. had against the Soviet Union was nuclear strike. And then we went to precision strike. Well, now everybody has precision strike. And now you're down to a 12-year-old kid with a drone, with a hobbyist drone, can do his own precision strike. And so the convergence of high-grade military attempts with very expensive drones down to um, hobbyists and, and smart people at the edge of battle adapting commercial drone technology, focusing on low cost to deliver payloads in a very jammed environment, both Ukrainian versus Russian and Russian versus Ukrainian. In fact, just, um, uh, just this week, I believe, the Russians launched the first fully autonomous drone attack, an unmanned attack, both ground and air, against um, Ukrainian lines. So it's, it's kind of a, uh, another Rubicon of warfare where you have no people showing up um, and, uh, and the machines are sent against uh, your enemy. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna come back to tanks being driven with no body inside of it. But before that, so the first application for drones in the battlefield was probably 2010, 2012. I know that uh, the Obama administration used it extensively, no, the, or the was it much earlier? first drone strike was actually done uh, the fall of 2001, solely because the counterterrorism center in the late 90s said, ah, this drone is kind of a nice idea, let's try to arm it. And so they strapped, they literally bolted down a, a Predator drone on the ramp out in uh, Nellis Air Force Base, test fired a Hellfire missile, an anti-tank missile, and that was why there was, ar that's why the U.S. had armed drones after 9-11. So, all right, so we've had 23 years of experience in the field, twice as long as I thought. Um, and so the, the evolution of that technology has probably moved dramatically just in the last few years because I don't think people have a real understanding. What are the, uh, what's the scope of drones? Are we talking about small ones? We're talking about large ones? Uh, you know, the, the, the large drones like the Predator or the, um, uh, the Predator B, uh, a big turboprop aircraft is, is up there for 24 hours at 25,000 feet or higher with all kinds of SATCOM, a huge 20-inch gimbaled ball camera, can read a license plate or identifies a man's face from that altitude. Um, those are of very limited effectiveness. Uh, or they're, they're, Those are in high danger if you try flying that over a battle space like Ukraine because a lot of missiles going to take it out, which is why the Houthis have actually shot down a couple of Predator drones trying to do that over the, uh, the Yemen theater. So small and expendable um, is the, the way it is today, uh, especially when you have a contested battle space. And, and does size matter for, for stealthiness? Is, well, is the, the, the Predator drones show up about like a 737. It's not stealthy. Um, but again, adapting to small drones where people are using cardboard or wood uh, things that don't show up well on radar uh, will make it very, very um, difficult for traditional radars and air defenses to detect. So again, an asymmetric attack on America is going to use hobbyist, non-standard materials carrying a payload that could be flown into every aircraft we have sitting along the flight line, a, a, a whole nother Pearl Harbor Day of Inf Infamy kind of attack that's launched from within the United States. And I wanna to touch on some specific examples in the news this week, but, but before I do that, uh, ragtag radical Islamic uh, organizations, um, Hamas, the Houthis, Hezbollah, obviously they're getting ISIS. funding from Iran, but ISIS. So they all now have this technology and are using it against us and Israel, yes? Yes, and ISIS was using it heavily in Iraq and in Syria as well, to the point of, of taking a quad, a, a small quadcopter, using it to drop grenades. There's, I mean, there's sadly a lot of videos of them dropping them through the uh, the hatch of a Humvee vehicle mm -hmm. from uh, from a thousand feet, mm -hmm. killing the occupants. So again, everybody has precision strike now, and now the precision strike has dis diffused down to the smallest, lowest tactical level. Mm -hmm. And, and my worry is the U.S. procurement system can't in any way keep up with that. 
and, and which is why we have $2 million missiles, and they have to double tap it, so they fire two missiles to fire to take down a twenty dollars to $50,000 drone, which has been fired hundreds of times by the Houthis uh, or by Iranian-friendly militias in Iraq against U.S. forces. And so coming up with better hard-kill, low-cost capability is essential. Uh, and again, our Pentagon... We're really not can't, there. Uh, we're a long ways from there, and, and we're not learning those lessons. And so, sadly, the, the next foe that, uh, that figures that out is going to teach it to us in a most uh, painful manner. So, a lot of news, even just this very week, with uh, drone strikes. First, I want to talk about the strike uh, on this supposed Iranian consulate in Damascus, Syria, where uh, the Israelis uh, were able to... Uh, kill seven Iranian military advisors, including three generals. Uh, that was a rather devastating hit. Interestingly, uh, Iran, although it's supposedly a consulate, right? So if it's a consulate, that's the same thing as hitting Iranian territory, although this was in Damascus, Syria. Uh, the Iranians are showing a little bit of caution, saying, oh, we'll retaliate at a time and, and uh, yeah, look, you know, it's, it, it was, of our they, choosing. They, they killed the IRGC guy, which ran Hezbollah. Uh, so very much a military target. That's, very a, that's much their, significant. It's a significant strike. target. The Israelis were trying to degrade Hezbollah's ability to to get after Israel to try to you know protect their northern front. But um, it was a uh, a bold move, and they took it, and uh, and that one worked. The one that didn't work, sadly, in the news a lot now. The 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 seven aid workers from the uh, the food charity uh, were were hit. That was. Uh, they had dropped off food in Gaza. They were on their way back out. The vehicles were a couple of kilometers uh, separate, and they were actually hit by almost simultaneously. And that was for their own protection, that, that, that distance, I think probably, so. right? But they were hit by a drone strike. My, my educated, semi-educated guess on that is that the, Isra the Israelis depended on a bad source, basically a double, who instead of saying, because he probably said, that convoy is a... Hamas convoy, strike it. Someone probably paid them. Perhaps the Iranians paid them to do that. Look, it, it's, a, it's a tragedy. It's dangerous operating in a war zone. Um, but... Um, uh, well, if they got intentionally the, the, the Israel, hoodwinked... The Israelis are really taking a black eye on that. Right, one. so if they got intentionally hoodwinked, then that worked very, very well for Hamas... Yep. Because now the international pressure comes back onto Israel to say, you need to cease fire, you need to back off. Civilians have been killed in the war zone because you struck them. So the only reasonable explanation from your expert perspective is that they got schnookered. That basically they, they got fooled. Uh, and it was a propaganda uh, campaign. A perfect, a perfect propaganda opportunity. Right, right. I mean, because the vehicles were marked. But someone told them or convinced them to say that is a Hamas convoy strike it. it wasn't one shot three vehicles that were spread out over multiple kilometers so both these instances uh in syria and then in gaza these were drone strikes executed by israel by the idf and uh, shows the devastating and successful impact you can have if you're trying yep. to take out your enemy but also the uh you know, civilian casualties. And as I, as I know, one off shit wipes out a whole lot of attaboys. Mm -hmm. Right. So, and then the other thing that just happened is the um, Ukrainians struck at an oil refinery almost 600 miles inside Russia. Now, why is that significant? What, 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 is that an advancement it, we haven't seen it, before? Because that is deep inside Russian territory. That's not six, that's not six miles inside Russia or 60, it's 600 miles. And there's this feel-good position that the U.S. has been pushing for years called the MCTR, the Missile Control Technology Regime. Sorry, MTCR, Missile Technology Control Regime, trying to keep um, any cruise missile or weapon that could fly more than uh, 300 kilometers out of people's hands. So obviously, uh, the Iranians ignored that one because they're using the Shahed 136s, giving it to the Houthis, smacking ships all over the Indian Ocean, Two, the Ukrainians just did it in a concrete way. Um, they hit a refinery, caused huge damage. They missed a drone factory that they were targeting themselves inside Russia. They, they, they were like two buildings off. But um, so the pervasive use of long range precision strike is everywhere now. And, and again, 
America is not ready for any kind of foe that comes against it because we're going to we're going to try to counter that with one and two million dollar shots per missile, which is quickly expended uh, when clearly people can drive the cost of those long range missiles down to a few tens of thousands of dollars, not millions of dollars. So what message was Ukraine sending? Hey, we can dive deep into your they're territory. Trying to, they're trying to up the transaction costs to, to make the Russian people and especially the Russian government um, bleed. So even though there weren't any uh, any deaths from that strike, there were some some injured. I don't it didn't know, matter. but they, was, were, they were they were trying to decap the oil industry. Where does Ukraine get that technology? They develop that themselves. Really? Yes. Again, a reliable motor, a turbine engine. Ukraine is a big, made turbine engines that. The big concentration of science knowledge of the Soviet Union, a huge part of that, um, was in Ukraine already. And so you take a reliable turbine, any kind of guidance system you can buy almost off the Internet, um, and it doesn't really need a camera. It's just going to drive itself to a, a specific coordinate. And they're not going to be jamming that far inside of Russia. You'd be, you'd be a threat to your own aviation if you try to jam that far in. And the Ukrainians are using sea drones as well. Tell me about that. Yes, and they've had great success in driving the Russian Navy largely off of the, the Black Sea uh, to the point now that even ships are able to reach from the Bosporus, you know, past Turkey, hugging along the Romanian coast and making it to the port of Odessa to even offload and to, and to export products. But you're saying the Russians have somewhat re like retreated from the Black Sea because of the effectiveness of the they Ukrainian not, drone they, they, strikes? Right when they invaded, the Russian ships were right up on the Ukrainian coast. Mm -hmm. But the fact that the, the Ukrainians have developed and fielded and deployed up until just, you know, still to this day, smacking any Russian ship that comes around there. And, that you know, not every, su not every suicide drone um, that's launched hits, but... If, if one out of three or one out of five hits, that's still really good math. You mentioned uh, autonomous ground uh, 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 material. Yes. Uh, by, by the Russians. That sounds fascinating to me. Uh, is that commonly held technology? Is this new? Where does that stand in this picture? <sighs> the battle is the ultimate uh, laboratory of, of innovation because right. you have to innovate or you're, or you're dead. And so that is happening in both those countries really quickly. And uh, apparently the, the Russians have, have taken a lot of elements of their old industry because they're still out, out matching, they're out shooting Ukraine like six to one in artillery. But the fact that they've even developed a, a air land autonomous drone warfare capability is, is significant. Like I said, it was a month ago, I was at the Saudi defense show in Riyadh, and there was a lot of Russian vendors there showing all their wares from loitering munitions, suicide drones, ground combat vehicles, um, with current video of them destroying NATO origin systems. Um, for, for the neocon argument to say, ah, oh, we're, we're degrading the Russian army, Russian army is getting smarter and smarter and smarter and applying those technologies. So right now they're, uh, they're conducting ground attacks through these autonomous vehicles and they're going to gain a lot of insight and knowledge from just they're learning, just exercising. They're learning and, and getting option. smarter. And now you're not going to see any huge offensives effective now in Ukraine for the next few months. You have to wait until the fields dry. It's now a, a period called the great Rasputitsa, the great slush. Um, you know, any, any good farm field that's covered with snow and then it melts is mm -hmm. a big mud bog. Right. So there'll be limited pushes, but, uh, but come June, yikes, get out. That's, that is tank country and tank weather. So uh, in, as, as we move ahead with this, uh, it, it, it still blows my mind. I, I envision this room uh, in, in Russia uh, with uh, a, a, like a bunch of gamers with the headsets on, controlling the autonomous vehicles, is that, is that what the control rooms yeah, are like Yeah, in this? that case, they're much closer to the edge of battle. They okay. might be three to five kilometers away. Okay, all right. So, so they're nearby. So uh, the U.S., it, let's exit on this. Uh, it's our bloated military-industrial complex, you say, has got us way behind in that technology. Uh, if you're Donald Trump and we win in November, what does he do to address this deficiency? Um, fire all the acquisitions people in the Pentagon and replace them with people that are coming from the private sector because you need to buy at the speed of 
private innovation, not at the speed of government or Washington. Incredible. So, last question. And you can actually spend a lot less doing that. Okay. Force A, a force the issue by spending less on defense. B, replace people. People is policy. The failure of the Trump administration in not securing, in not really controlling its security apparatus last time was leaving a lot of the same wrong actors in place. So by its nature, drone technology should be saving more lives from our own trip troops, I, I assume. That's got to be one of the major benefits. And yet, if we're at a disadvantage to the enemy, we won't have that advantage. Is, is that a good reading? Look, this idea, the, 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 I, the, the, the focus of the left on diversity, equity, inclusion, and ESG, and all the other nonsense, pushing that in mil in, into uh, the military, instead of focusing on lethality, how many, how, how, how lethal can you be for as low cost as possible? That's what matters. This idea that um, uh, we don't really need strong soldiers, we just need diverse soldiers because the war, it's all going to be push button electronic is complete bullshit because the fact that Ukraine develops a weapon which is striking targets 600 miles inside of Russia with all the Russian air defenses still getting through, the idea that um, anywhere in the battlefield is not the front lines, is we're deluding ourselves. Well, in the way in which the Biden administration has opened the doors wide open, you know, to their DEI policies, I would think it won't take long for Donald Trump to rid the military of all this uh, absurd policy that's weakened us. Only the right people will make those decisions. Understood. Well, uh, I think as we move ahead with drone technology, there is a lot for us to examine and study. Uh, with the strikes in, uh, in uh, Syria this week, tragically the one in Gaza, but also uh, Ukraine striking Russia. Yeah. There's a lot for us to study. Remember, this, is, this was a significant week in the evolution of drone warfare, and there's going to be a lot more. Excellent. You heard it from the expert, one of the great pioneers in drone technology, uh, Eric Prince. This is an amazing topic for us to cover more of in the future. As for now, this is Off Leash with Eric Prince. I'm Mark Serrano. Catch you next segment.